Welcome to Everything Life Coaching. I'm John Kim. And I'm Noelle Cordo. We are the founders of Lumia. And we're super passionate about all things coaching, and we want to share what we've learned from over a decade of coaching and training thousands of life coaches. Let's dive into the science and magic of coaching. On today's episode, we are talking about self-awareness as the super skill of 2023, but I think it's the super skill just it's not just 2023. It's a life super skill. It is a life super skill. And and I think, you know, that's something that's super important to center in self-awareness is it's a buzzword. And it's one of those soft skills that a lot of folks are hearing that they need to harness it, that they need to be self-aware. And I'd like to unpack like what self-awareness does how it functions, how it lives in the world, and what we really need to know about it in yes. order to get the benefit. Yeah. And you know, self-awareness has become a word I actually don't like because you're right, it's become a buzzword. It's just too generic now. And so we're going to get more specific. We're going to talk about defense mechanisms, right, as one part of this. So yeah, we're going to get deeper. We're also going to get more specific instead of just the broad term of self-awareness. Yeah. We're going to get right. into the tactical how of it, how we use yes. it, how we live with it, what it does. And it's it's actually pretty fun. And so kind of framing this thing, self-awareness lives in three places. The foundation of it, the very bottom of it, the place that we're going to spend the most time unpacking is self-awareness represents our ability to see ourselves. Mm -hmm. And this is a 360 thing. And it, it really bridges the gap between the external world and our internal reality. Right. And something about self-awareness that I think often gets misrepresented is that people think about behavior, that if I'm aware of myself, I'm aware of my behavior. But another huge piece of it is being aware of our feelings, our emotions, our values, our motivations, and understanding how those things show up and then the impact that we actually have in the world. And do they align? Is what I'm seeing and feeling and what I value and what I want, am I creating that impact? Yeah, I think for me, self-awareness always starts inside it's about the inner journey and then the behavior to me is the ripple from exploring the the inner journey it, the behavior is yeah. the ripple and then as we walk that bridge out of our interior just looking inside of ourselves outside the behavior and why that's important for awareness is how others see us right and right. it's and then also like behavior, of course, is going to, you know, change your life. I mean, a change in behavior, of course, can change your life. But I just love the idea of working inside out instead of outside. And I think a lot of especially in the fitness world, they tend to start from behavior or outside ex the external and then hoping that changes the internal. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, so many times. It's it's what's around us. It's our resources mm -hmm. and the the conditions that we exist in that also really contribute to our ability to change our behavior yeah. and how we yeah. show up. The next layer of awareness is other awareness, and that's awareness of the people around us, our family, mm -hmm. our friends, our colleagues, and that's being able to identify what are their values, what are their needs. What are their feelings? Mm -hmm. What are their motivations? And because this all relates to how do we move through the world in a better way for ourselves, what resources do others have, right? Yeah, um, and also what's their story, you know? So yeah. not only seeing them as your aunt or your mom or the guy you went to high school with, but uh, has a story. And I think that if you also understand their story, it's so much easier to see them as a being, as a human, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's a the the perfect segue into the third layer of awareness, which is called organizational awareness. Mm. But it really applies to any system that you're a part of. So the three systems that I think of for people are your job, your mm -hmm. family, and your friend group. 
yeah, those, those are, are big, three cysts. Big, big, big pieces of your life. And what you said is, is the story is when we're looking at organizational awareness and we're thinking about, well, you know, what is the reality of my system? What is the reality of my environment? Can I see my family honestly? Can I see my place of work honestly? Can I see my friend group honestly? That requires taking a look at the history. Yeah. Would you say that that a relationship with like the person that you love, one person, would that be a system or a system more like the family unit? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That is 100% the, the system. That's the relationship. It's a mm-hmm. system that's outside of you and the other person. And right. so that, that duo has a, a history, right. has experiences, and, and there's awareness of others. And then there's awareness of, of what happens with the unit itself. Because mm-hmm. I can't remember the theorist, I used to have this at recall, but there's a theorist whose work I use that talks about person one, person two, and then the relationship itself is a third entity. Is that yeah. Johnson? Do you remember the citation? Is that Johnson? Do I have that right? I don't know, but I, I actually personally talk about this all the time. There's you, there's your, your, your partner, and then there, it doesn't matter if it's a friendship or intimate relationship. And then there is what both of you are contributing to, which is actually greater than its parts, right? It's a whole nother thing. Yeah. Absolutely. And the reason that we're talking about this in the context of coaching is because it's our job as coaches to work with the skill of self-awareness so that we can very clearly understand how our clients are consuming us that's part of the competency of trust and safety. We have to be aware of our biases. We have to be aware of our tone. We have to be aware of when we might say declarative things that don't actually relate to the client's life. And then from from the client perspective, helping the client harness these different levels of self-awareness, organizational awareness, and other awareness is part of our job as coaches to help people move forward. Yeah. And also I think we have to be aware of what is happening inside us as we're working with our clients. So the, you know, the stuff that comes up, right. That's tied to our story. It is. Yeah, it is. And, and it's, it's this little loop. Julianne, one of our, our instructors, Julianne Weiss, one of our instructors did a podcast with me on reframing and it was really good. And, And she had a pull quote that I have been using nonstop. She said that when people encounter the world, they don't see the world as it is. Mm. They see the world as they are. Or, yeah, that's, a, that's a, actually a, in therapy school. That's one of the most popular quotes. Oh, who is yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's by Christine Fonesca. Mm. And she's the one who coined the phrase, the unreliable narrator, mm. yeah. which is our brain. <laughs> Yeah, you see the world not as it is, but as you are for sure. But uh, yeah. yeah, and 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 that's really the core of beginning to unpack self awareness is is that understanding that when we when we first start to work with self awareness, all of the different layers are kind of like nesting dolls mm-hmm. that they and we have to start with self awareness because that helps us build out to awareness of others. And then that helps us build out further to what happens when we're part of an organizational system, right? Yeah. So the place I wanted to dive in here is one of the things that coaching tells us is absolutely necessary, that when we become aware of things and things are not working the way we want them to, Mm -hmm. and life is not going exactly the way we want it to, what has to happen next is that awareness bridges the gap to a plan and then the plan bridges the gap to action. But what we're really talking about is doing things differently. Yeah. And with self-awareness, as I was researching this topic, the thing that came up for me that I was really surprised by, honestly, as a way in is if we need to do things differently, then we first need to understand what we're doing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, what, what are we doing that's not working? And defense mechanisms 
came up mm. as one of the number one blockers to self-awareness. Yeah. yeah. And I had the most ironic response to this topic when I first was like, oh, defense mechanisms. I was like, I don't do that. <laughs> I right. was like, is, fuck, fuck, there it is. is. <laughs> there it is, yeah. <laughs> What's your experience with defense mechanisms? No, it's a huge, huge, huge door. I mean, so what, what I know about relationships, including, you know, the, your relationship with yourself, ownership is what draws people in. Ownership is what creates curiosity, growth, change, empowerment, right? Owning something. Yeah. And so when you're defending, there's no ownership. So yeah. it's really hard to build any relationship or grow with someone or a system if people are defensive. So when, when I think about defense, I think about war, I think about holding up shields. And yeah. uh, ownership, I think about open arms. Ownership, I think about, you know, and like we say, the the mirror and the flashlight and looking inward and then evolution, you know, and also defensive people, just not attractive people, really hard to work with. Oh, people that own very inspiring and attractive and, you know, people you want to be around. Yeah. I mean, the irony, irony, irony is, is the thing that just keeps coming up, up for me with defense mechanisms. I loved your metaphor of the shield because defense mechanisms are actually good for us in emergency situations. Defense mechanisms are really important in emergency situations that shield can actually save you. But in day-to-day -day circumstances, they actually limit your ability to adapt because they keep you from crucial self-knowledge and emotional intelligence. Yeah, it's the greatest blocker. It is the greatest learning. blocker. Yeah. And the reason I think it, they're so ironic is because everyone sees them. Everyone is aware when they're dealing with somebody who's, who's experiencing defensiveness. And a lot of times those folks are characterized as difficult. Yes. But yes. it's really a, a self-protection mechanism. So, Yeah. And so bringing, bringing it back to coaching, it's once you discover the defense, it's with a client's permission, exploring where that defense is coming from. And I think this is where the, the, the work begins, you know. It is. So a helpful guide for coaches, we're going to link to it in the blog, the positivepsychology.com has a really great article that's like a full rundown of every single possible defense mechanism. But for our time today, I just pulled out a few that I think are really common so that we could play around with them from a coaching context and talk about how they show up, how they work, and what we can do about them. Nice. So, I would love to see this list. And if you're interested, go to the website Noel is talking about and you can see the whole list. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. We'll link it for you. So projection is the first one. And projection happens when somebody's scared that there's this thing out there that's going to threaten their self-concept. And so typically the person can't see that the thing that they're scared of, they actually possess, but they're aware of it somewhere in their consciousness. And so they assign it to somebody else and, and, and demonize somebody else. Mm, projecting. Yes. So uh, have, it's also another one way to not take ownership. <laughs> that's, oh, yeah. Assign, assign something to someone else. Yeah. Where, where have you seen this happen? I mean, obviously with clients yeah. all the time, whether I'm wearing the hat of a therapist or a coach, a lot of projection in friendships. You know, when you hang out with friends over, you know, breakfast and mimosa and people start talking about what they're into or what's happening. Like, like, for example, if someone comes into your friendship, it's like, oh, I just got promoted. I just got this book deal. I just got this big thing. Instead of celebrating that, if someone then sees like, oh, but that's going to now take a year of your life to write. Ah. There's, there's projection <laughs> happening, right? Yeah. <laughs> something else happening that is, yeah, that's happening in the person that is, you know, taking the, the black light and seeing the negative instead of being able to hold space and celebrate for their friend. Yeah, yeah. Where where I see this is if somebody is like hostile or angry or in a bad mood all the time, 
and they're watching, you know, the people around them or they're experiencing the people around them respond to this, but they're not willing to see themselves or they can't see themselves. And so they're going to say, there's something wrong with my team. <laughs> They they have these anger management problems. They're cranky all the time. Like yeah, yeah. The 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 P I remind myself in projection is uh, to me stands for pointed fingers. Ooh, and, I like and that. So I I see that I see it globally happening. I like a lot that. of a lot of projection right now. When how do you notice this in clients, and and how might you? present this to someone as something that they might want to think about. Yeah. So I spot it when people start using, stop using I, I statements, when they start saying he, she, they, that, you know, kind of like subtly putting themselves into victim mode. Someone did something to me. You start losing power. You start blaming, you start losing any chance of ownership. The opposite of that is when someone tells you something happened and then they tell you their part in it or what it was mm. like for. So whenever you bring it back to you, you're generally projecting less. Whenever you start, um, you know, projecting and saying how things are and blah, blah, blah. And it was them. And I, then you're now, I think, projecting more. Awesome. I like that. Something that came up for me is in that situation where if somebody's saying, you know, there's something wrong with my my whole team, or there's something wrong with this employee, or my spouse or my partner was really hostile. They have a problem. They have an anger or management problem. I might probe a little bit and say, oh my goodness, I'm sorry to hear that. Can you tell me what happened? Can you describe the issue? And if it's projection, they won't be able to because it's right. a misassignment. Yeah. 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 I love that. Yeah. The next one is called displacement. And this happens when a client has an original target of their upset or anger, and they can't deal with whatever it is because it's too psychologically powerful or painful. The original target is considered unacceptable or impossible. And so they assign their feelings to something else. Freud argued that this is commonly used in dreaming, which is really interesting. I think of displacement a lot with the way that couples function. Mm. Have you seen this in your life or work? I'm trying to think. Maybe with families with not with you know poor boundaries, maybe displacement happens, but I can't think of like an example. Yeah. So an example for me is, you know, if somebody has a really bad day at work and they mm -hmm weren't able to speak up for themselves and they maybe they got yelled at. They go home and yell at their wife, kid or dog. Oh, yes. Okay, that's a great I love how simple that is. Okay, so that's me. <laughs> really? Yeah, I display shit all the time. I displace like I like I'm littering. No, that <laughs> no, I, I I'll be honest. That used to be me. I do I do I mean I now pause at the front door, take a breath and try to leave that outside before coming in. But yes, a lot of displacement in my twenties and thirties because my career wasn't going anywhere, for example, I would come home and I would displace my frustration and feeling a lack of purpose and all of that onto my partner, whoever I was wow. loving at the time. So that kind of stuff, right? I've heard you talk a lot about your dad recently and the way that he would show up in kind of like a frenzy with things. Yes. So he, I learned displacement from him. And I wonder how much that is tied to addiction, because I know when you're, he was an alcoholic, and I wonder if you're, you know, they say emotionally you're stunted when you start using and all of that. And, and I, I know he didn't have any, as far as self-awareness is very, very, he was charismatic, and I loved that he was adventurous, and he taught me to take risks and build the bus while you're driving. I got a lot of great things from him, but as far as displacement, I mean, he was the king. He would, he would come home, and his mood, his attitude, all of it, as a father, was not by choice, but it was, you know, how much we sold or how his day was going or, you know, whatever happened outside yeah. carried into the home. And then, of course, absorbed by the nine, 10 year old sons that he had. So he yeah. wasn't responsible with his own emotional. He wasn't able to emotionally regulate. Mm. 
Yeah. Yeah. And and I think that's rich soil for displacement is because we just bounce the anger around or the fear or whatever the emotion is like a ball. We just pass the hot potato, right? Yes. And that's why most of my 20s, it came in the form of pouty. <sighs> In relationships, very pouty. Like if I didn't I get mean, sex, I was pouty. If I didn't get this, I was oh, pouty. You know, as a adult child. What I adult wish, child of an alcoholic? Is that where it was? I mean, yeah. you as a pouty twenty year old is adorable. First of all, like not as a forty nine year old. It's not. It's not so cute. <laughs> <laughs> fair, yeah. totally. Maybe fair. maybe as a twenty year old, it, you know, it's okay. You can see. Okay, it's kind of adorable. But as a forty nine year old, pouty no, that is not not attractive. Anyway. Non sequitur, before we move on to denial, speaking of you being 49 and your birthday coming up, do you know what is happening, John? You mean for my birthday? Well, or, we or can... like in the world or how the, stars are lining up? What this are you talking is about? why I wanted Cosmic to birth? talk to you about it. What is happening? I mean, Fish. I think I know. <laughs> Fish is coming to LA oh. around your birthday, and I wow. feel like I should take you to a fish show. <laughs> I heard I heard nothing after fish. After Noel said fish, I heard nothing. So this is where Noel and I kind of we part ways. Noel is a has been a fish fan for years. But you know, the thing about fish is it's not just music. So there's like a whole culture behind it and it comes with, you know, it comes with a tone. And it's something that I just I just I can't relate to. But I'm gonna plant I, if seeds. It, listen, it, We're if gonna it brings sprinkle seeds. If it brings you to LA, then that's awesome. I would love it. I would love to see you for my 50th. We're doing something in the Palm Springs area. But yeah, if it brings you to LA, that'd be great. Awesome. Yeah, but awesome. Leave, leave, be, be us, be, practice self-awareness and leave fish at the door before you come. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. Yeah. Well, now this brings us to our next piece, uh, which I can utilize in this situation, which is denial. Denial is the client's refusal to acknowledge certain facts about this particular situation. Yeah, Just like yeah. I'm, I'm acknowledging that that would be for, for my pleasure to bring you to a fish concert and not necessarily for yours. But beyond facts, denial, I think is really interesting because it can also be the existence of specific feelings, mm. thoughts, or even perceptions. Oh, that, deny, denying feelings, th denying thoughts, perceptions, which also kind of can lead to kind of stonewalling. Yeah, mm -hmm. it can. And it also leads to blocking your intuition. Have you ever been in a relationship where you're like, I need to get out of this, but you won't let yourself think about it? Yeah. Or you believe in false hope or you're not seeing the truth of it. You know, all of those, you're, you're convincing yourself of something that isn't your truth or how you really feel, that kind of thing. Denial. And it's the reason that our brain uses denial is to protect itself from a particular state of the world, consequences, or even from themselves in terms of how their behavior might be showing up. And this is the piece where. Denial is typically usually really visible to everybody around you, and you're just hanging on for dear life. The situation that I have as an example is that at work, somebody got feedback that they're alienating clients. They're not communicating effectively. They're not, they're not communicating with empathy, and it's causing problems. That's feedback. And this person believes themselves to be an excellent communicator. And so they argue that the manager's jealous of them. They argue that they were stressed out. They argue that the, the client is hostile. And the hallmarker of denial is when it's everybody but you. Yeah, I mean, if it's, if it's everyone but you, then, then yeah, that's a, it's telling, right? <laughs> that's how it shows up in coaching sessions. That's what I listen mm -hmm. for. It's similar to what you said earlier, when there's a root issue and the client is circling it and circling it and circling it. And the one piece that's missing is, and this is my role in this. Right. And this is where I need to be accountable. Right, right. And especially when folks are given direct feedback that something is true and they're angry at the feedback. That's also yeah. a reason to look into denial. And then the last one I want to hit, which I do, this is mine. 
big time is called undoing. And that's mm -hmm. when people ruminate on previous events and replay them over and over and in their brain, redo the scripts. You can't change what happened. The past is in the past, but it's, it's a function of your brain where you make yourself feel better by somehow gaining power over what mm. happened. Mm. And it just robs your attention. You lose time. You don't actually fix things. You activate right. your nervous system. You get yourself into an emotional tailspin. And it's really is this, not helpful. Is this very, is this very ego driven? Is this lined with control? Well, this is rich fodder for psychoanalysis. It might be. Yeah, it might be. Know. And so kind of using myself as an example here, something that I know about myself is that when I look at my own stress responses, which are mm -hmm. run, fight, hide, I only have fight. I only mm. show up with fight. I never run and I never hide. I could sense that about you for sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, you know, as kind and as gentle and as warm and soft as you are, the other gear you have, it, <laughs> it is seriously is like pick up the knife and fight. It's like those two gears I see with you. Yep. Yep. It's either yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm a love bug or murder, death, kill. Those are the mm -hmm. two modes. And so when I'm ruminating, when I'm undoing, it's coming from that stress response of fight. I'm replaying mm -hmm. the fight in my head over and over again. And all it's doing is jacking my nervous system. Yeah. Yeah. It, it doesn't have any positive outcome. And her expressing this is being self-aware. Yeah. Look at yes. that. <laughs> there we go. And that's why we're having this conversation is the whole point of even talking about this stuff is, are we learning? Mm -hmm. Are we having new experiences and actually learning from them as we're moving through life? In right. coaching, we characterize this as the difference between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. Mm -hmm. If Good we're one. able to, yeah, understand ourselves as imperfect mm -hmm. with room to grow it's really cool to learn things about ourselves that can help us experience more peace. And I think that's one of the functions of self-awareness that has gotten lost in its popularity and mm. in the buzziness of it is folks are told you need to be self-aware for others, but really what it does is give you internal peace at the end mm -hmm. of the day. Mm -hmm. I love so, it. I love, I love that. Given that there are the three layers, which is the self, others, and organizational, we spend a lot of time on the self, and I want to spend less time on the other two, but I also want to talk about them because they're important to actualize. If, mm -hmm. if we just work on the self and we just stay with the self, we don't really change anything. And so we need to, in order to continue to evolve in our learning, bridge the gap outward. Yes. So next up is other awareness. And there's two pieces to other awareness. The big one that really helps us in life is when we have other awareness, we have a lens and a view as to how others see us, mm -hmm. how we show up, and how all of the things about us contribute to the environment, the relationships, and the systems that we live in so mm -hmm. that we can change things if we're not showing off the way that we want to. You've been on a long journey with this. And I don't know that you've named it as other awareness, but what has your experience been? Well, would other awareness also being aware of how others impact you and where you decide to draw boundaries, who you decide to send the voicemail and kind of like creating a safe container for yourself, or at least the practice of that? It is. It yeah. is. And, and that goes hand in hand with two sides of that coin. Mm -hmm. One side of the coin is, you know, where do my boundaries need to be? And then the other side of the coin is when you're scanning your environment, where are my resources? Mm. Where are the people who do contribute to my life? If mm. my goal is to go from point A to point B, who in my environment do I need to get buy-in from? Who in my yeah. environment do I need help from? Who in my environment can help me, you know, who can, who can show up for me. 
and having awareness of others is a lot is a big part of partnership. Mm -hmm. I think our relationship is a really good example of other awareness. We're both aware on a regular basis of the resources that we both bring to the table. And we mm -hmm. both spend time to check in and find out where the other is at so that we can both be aware and then leverage those resources. I mean, I think for me, at least, that's why our partnership works and why we're still friends <laughs> is, yeah, I mean, throughout the years, us, because man, the evolution, right? And the internet and all of this, and also us, the roles that we have in this whole Lumia space changes, you know? Yeah. And, and yeah, the, uh, the adjustment and communicating and all of that. It's always been something I've been kind of scared of going into, but also it's been something I felt safe with, with you through time and consistency. And then because of my life and what I do and, and I'm all over the place and all the weird shit I do and all the things I throw at the wall, a lot of times I don't have answers <laughs> and being okay with that and, you know, that, that whole stuff. Yeah. So it's been nice. Yeah, it, it is nice. And when we think about this, okay, well, how do we develop other awareness? You and I have been really lucky to have had a, a partnership and lots of relationship in our lives where there's people that we trust who, who have gained our trust over yeah. time. Yeah. But the way to hack this, if you don't have a 10-year partnership with a trusted business partner who calls you on your shit, is to have loving critics, people who actually have your best interest at heart that you can step aside with and say, hey, I'm really working on myself. Can you give me some insight as to how I show up or how others see me? Or even you don't mm -hmm. have to tell me who they are, but some things that have some ways that I've been described to you by others. Yeah. It's also a good test to see how defensive they get or not get. Not they yet. meaning they meaning if you're asking someone else for some criticism, if you're going to get very de defensive or not, or if you're going to take it in, you know. Are you going to take it in? I mean, you have to psychologically prepare for feedback because when you have the experience of feeling that you're wrong, that triggers your reptilian brain and your brain associates that feeling with impending death. So working to overcome that impulse and acknowledge, I'm going to hear some things about myself that are really uncomfortable, but I need to hear them about myself so that I can change the way that I show up yeah. in order to experience more of what I want in life. Ultimately, it's all about what you want to experience. There's a, a trick that goes along with asking for feedback from others, and that's to ask a lot of different people so that you're not just going off of one person's opinion. And if somebody says something that really doesn't resonate with you, to gut check it with someone else, right? Right, right. That's part of what 360s do in coaching, which are 360 interviews with everyone around the clients so that they begin to understand how others see them. Mm -hmm. I've never liked that process because it's not organic. And the person usually going through the 360 is not coming at it from a place of autonomy of genuinely wanting to know right. the way that I like to work with this stuff is to get somebody psychologically prepared for criticism first. And then move into a space where they're ready to receive feedback. Right. I love that you have that, that primer. Yeah. Well, humans are sensitive little nuggets, man. Yeah. Like, Tell me about if it. If you unleash information on somebody and they're not prepared for it, no, number one, they're, yeah. they're, like, they're not going to receive the information yeah, yeah, yeah. and you're going to have a, a cluster on your hands. So communication has to be handled with care. And yeah. that leads us to our third layer, which is something that none of us can avoid, which is organizational awareness. All of us are mm -hmm. part of groups that are organized into systems. Your family system, your friend group, partnership two people can be an organizational system, your job, if you belong to a gym. Mm -hmm. All of these are their own little microcosms and there's people in them. <laughs> And there are rules and there's a history and there's feelings and there's goals. And this is universal, no matter what kind of system we're talking about. And drawing 
bridging out from other awareness to, well, let's look at the system that we're all a part of is, mm -hmm. is the third and highest layer of awareness that you can harness. Yeah. I love it. I love the, man, I love all the tears that we talked about today under the umbrella of self-help and thank you for going so deep with this. Indeed. Indeed. The organizational awareness piece is, is cool. And this was the pull quote that I, that really kind of opened my eyes to it is like, say you're going to run a race, right? Mm -hmm. If you're not taking it into account, whether you're running that race in a blizzard or in a rainforest and how that will impact your performance, you're not dealing with your environment appropriately. Mm. And so for organizational awareness, your job is to look at the characteristics of your environment, the people, the history, mm. you know, all of it consider and it say, all. and consider it all. Mm -hmm. How does this environment impact me? What do I need to know about it? What's the history of it? And I can't overemphasize enough the history piece because that lets us know what our current conditions are with, with an organizational awareness you and I were not born yesterday and ended up on this podcast. We have we have a 10-year history between us. And so we can't pretend that the entire history behind us doesn't impact this moment right, right now. Right, of course. Yeah. 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 So to close out, you know, what do we do with this? And how do we work with it? And, and really, how do we work with clients? And the thing that I think that's important to recognize as we're looking at defense mechanisms and we're looking at all of the different layers is where people get stuck mm -hmm. and where people get stuck. It's moving between awareness of how others perceive us because of fear, fear of judgment, fear of being imperfect, fear that I'm not showing up right, fear that I'm getting it wrong. And that is the number one thing that blocks us from taking stock of what actually is. So you can gather data in a logical way and make a plan forward versus relying on the faulty narrator to yeah. tell you what's up. I think this is important as a coach to think about when you're working with clients, but also just as important as a coach to think about for own self and own self yeah. journey. You know, yeah. so when you're in the room, you're not just doing a copy and paste or something that you heard on a podcast. You're actually pulling from own experience. Well, thank you for listening, everyone. Thanks for listening to Everything Life Coaching. If you're feeling the draw to become a coach, head to lumiacoaching.com slash everything. Explore a new career that brings fulfillment, gives you a true sense of purpose and a bold community to do it with. Lumia is ready to equip you with the tools, training, and community you will need to reach your goals. If you're ready to build a unique coaching business on your own terms while making an impact on the world at large, Lumia is the next bold step in your coaching journey. That's lumiacoaching.com slash everything. And hey, if you're waiting for a sign, this is it. <laughs>